each of us today as we, we came in. School started. Work might be changing up. We might have a new boss. We might have uh, new neighbors. We might be trying to move. There's an unlimited possibility of the stressors, anxieties that can be going on in our life. Each of us has the opportunity to lay these burdens down right now at the feet of Jesus. We do. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. He knows our hearts. There is not one thing that has ever been made, including each and every one of us, that he does not have a hand in, right? So let's stand as we read from God's word. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 and 7 says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Let's sing together.
because he lives, we can face tomorrow, we can face today, we can face whatever comes. Brandon, you can go ahead and have a seat. Well, as we enter into this time of pastoral prayer, uh, just thinking about and can considering what, what do we want to pray for this week? God, what do you have in store? And uh, I was wanting to pray for our school year, and then we, Curtis told me we're praying for our teachers next week. So we're going to pause on that. We're going to pray for teachers and for students going back to school uh, next week. And so what I want to do is just take a moment and pray. I think at the beginning of a school year, there are lots of anxieties. There's lots of questions. There's all of those things that I think a lot of us, just this time of year, just the hustle and bustle of life as things are kind of getting back into rhythm after school for all of us. And, and one of the things that has stood out to me in just our student ministry family. So if you're new with us, I'm Paul. I get served as the student pastor. Uh, one of the things that I've learned about our church over the last few years is that if you are around our students, you know that there we have about 125, 150 students in our ministry, and there are over 34 schools represented in that. So just to think about that, like 34 schools represented among 150-ish or so students, which means it's not just the students who are involved in those schools, but the families as well. That means there's 34 different parent groups. There's different text threads. There's all these different things. And what's so easy, what so easily happens is we become disconnected and fragmented. And so as a church, if we're not aware of those just dynamics like that, that we can measure 
it becomes very easy just to drift apart. And so as a church family, one of our prayers as your pastors is that when you come on a Sunday, you don't just fly in and fly out, but you find meaningful connection, that you talk to one another. And and I know that can be scary at times. We tell our kids and students, just talk, be friendly. But for us as adults, sometimes we need that reminder just to look across the aisle and say, hi, I'm so-and-so. How are you? Tell me about yourself to come to a life group, to to stay a little later than we might prefer, to invite someone else out for lunch, to have meaningful connections here at Brainerd so that we don't just pass one another every Sunday, week in, week out, not actually stick and know one one another. We're going to be hearing from the Gospel of John, but in John's epistle, John's letter in 1 John chapter 3, verse 18, he says this, Little children, let us not love in word or speech, but in action and in truth. We don't just want to have this concept of community, this wish dream of community, of connection, but actually to have meaningful connections that requires us to put ourselves out there, to be vulnerable, and to be truthful. We've just walked through Proverbs where we've heard all about wisdom. The thing about wisdom is that wisdom is always truthful, and we need God's help to do that. So now I want to pray as we consider what God has for us and how we can connect with one another. Let's pray. God, we come to you this morning. God, you have not called us to live in isolation. God, you have not called us in the hustle and bustle of life to make connection and community a backseat priority. But Lord, you have invited us to worship together with the saints, to be known and to be fully loved. And so Lord, I thank you that you put flesh and skin and bones on the one another's in scripture, that we Don't just love one another abstractly, but Lord, we love one another in grace and in truth. And so God, for those here today who might not know a single person in this room, God, maybe this is their first Sunday. Lord, I pray that this would be a church of connection and meaning and meaningful community. Lord, for those that have been here for a while and just kind of sat on the sidelines, Lord, I pray that they would, that you would call them out of their timidity, out of their anxiety, out of their fear, whatever it is that's holding them back. Lord, I pray that they would just talk to someone today. That might be the most important thing that they do today. And for those that have meaningful community, Lord, I pray that you would give them more seats around their table, that the community that we do have would not become cliquish or exclusive, but Lord, we would always be seeking to invite those who are far from God or those who are walking with God to come sit at our table. So God, give us more seats around the table. Allow us the freedom and the flexibility in our schedules to invite people to lunch, to have them into our homes, to see gospel-centered hospitality, to attend one another's birthday parties, to go to different games, to make space and time for community. So God, we feel it as a student ministry, but we know that's even more magnified as a collective church and as a collective body. So God, help us to live out the gospel in these meaningful ways. God, we can't do this. We can't orchestrate this. There's no plans. There's no programs that have the ability to do this. God, we need you to do what only you can do. So God, allow us to walk in grace and truth this week. God, give us opportunities. Give us the motivation. We pray this all in your name. Amen.
Thanks, you can be seated. Yesterday, it felt like a huge privilege to be able to um, speak at a memorial service, really a celebration of life for a man who had been a member of our church for like 55 years, uh, Ken Kendall. And I just think of, it really is like Christ promised to build his church and he has built Brainerd Baptist Church and there's just generation after generation after generation. And um, I love seeing like a walk down in the preschool and kids area last week and even seeing the kids up here this week. And I'm just reminded of all that the Lord is doing in our church and how the Lord just has been so faithful over this man's life, but even it's going to extend further and his influence is going to extend further. So I'm grateful and grateful for you that God for his purposes has brought us here at this point in time. And I believe he has good things, good things in store. Um, If on your way in, you might've seen this, but we have scripture notebooks. We're going through the book of John and I think this will be till Thanksgiving. We're covering the first few chapters and uh, I've used these so you can tell like I've written in mine. It's helpful sometimes to write out prayers or connections or underline or circle. Some of you do that in a copy of God's word and some of you have digital copies and all that's great. But I do feel like if you're kind of a visual person that you love to make those connections, we've got those in the lobby. You uh, feel free to pick one up after the service. I want to start this way as far as our time in God's word today. I want you to think through how, if you were trying to introduce someone to me, what are some of the ways, what are some of the things at your disposal that you would try to, that you would try to use to introduce them to me? So imagine you have a friend or a coworker or a neighbor or a family member, and you wanted to introduce them, tell them Tell, tell me something about them. As you think about that, and I really do want you to think through like what, what would those kinds of things be, I'm guessing that a lot of times, intuitively, it happens through, I guess almost like categories. Categories, so if it were like you were trying to introduce someone to me and it was for a job or something like that, often a piece of paper accompanies that, a resume, and that resume will have Oh, employment history, and we'll have roles and titles and responsibilities. And sometimes it it will have experiences and skills and all these sorts of things, and that would help me get to know this person better. Other other categories that you might go is like, no, no, it would be more personal. I would I would maybe show you pictures of this person and, and maybe even show you a video of the person or tell a story about the person that would really embody who they are. And so that would be another way you could introduce a person to me. Another thing would be maybe relationships. Oh, she's a friend of this person or you know this person. Actually, they went to school together or they knew each other or they're a family member. This is their cousin. That would be another way of helping to connect some dots. Other, other things that certainly tell us who a person is would be um, a family tree or even nowadays DNA tests tell you something about who a person is, their ethnicity, their background, things that may even surprise you. Sometimes people will describe each other personality types. So this is a real extrovert or this is a real introvert or some other, you know, bubbly personality or something like that. Sometimes letters accompany that or even numbers accompany that. Oh, she's a five or, or you start giving, you know, Myers-Briggs letters, all these different ways. Now you could, you could even, you know, open your phone, go to social media and say, uh, here's her profile. And I don't know that you would get to know a person exactly. You would get to know what a person wants to present as, as themselves. You would at least get to see that side of them. I start in that place of like introducing someone because that's exactly what a man who lived 2,000 years ago named John, that's what he is doing in this book that we're going to look at, this book of the Bible. I want you to see how John is encouraging you to meet Jesus, to meet Jesus. We're going to spend several weeks looking really closely at what John records about him. And at the end of the account of uh, of Jesus' life that John gives, if you go all the way to the end, we're going to start at the beginning, but if you go all the way to the end, in John chapter 20, or nearly the end, John says this, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written 
Okay, why are they written? These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So John wants to introduce you to Jesus, but not just introduce him. He wants you to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. He wants you to know, deal with the reality of who Jesus is, but then also see the personal difference that believing in him makes in that believing you would have life through him, through his name. John wants you to experience that. And for today, so I walked through, I did, I walked through categories of like, well, I mean, I guess you could do a resume or a personality type, or you could do uh, stories or pictures. But when John wants you to meet Jesus, he has to use all new categories. It's like the categories we would use for almost every other person are completely insufficient. They do not get the job done. And so John, if I like had a, a title of this message, like meeting Jesus, meeting Jesus, you are meeting someone categorically different. He's just in different categories. And so we're going to process some of those categories together. He's not just an upgrade. He's not an improved, better version of me or better version of you. He is categorically different. And so I want you to hear that. Hunter's going to come read in John 1, 1 through 5. Let's hear God's word and listen for those category differences. morning. John 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word, uh, let's see here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Him, and apart from Him, not one thing was created that has been created. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and yet, the, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. Thanks for reading that. Categorically different. You get hints at that. Even as John does not start with the earthly name, Jesus. Notice how he starts. In the beginning was the word. And so immediately you get a hint. He could have said in the beginning was Jesus. In the beginning was the Messiah, the Christ, the Lord. But instead, he says, in the beginning was the word. He'll get to Lord and Christ and Messiah and Jesus. But here he starts with the word. And what he's doing is he's connecting so many things in the Bible that have preceded this account. He's going through all the Old Testament and he's drawing upon something very, very important when he uses the term, the word, the title, the word to describe Jesus. So in the Bible, God's word, in the Old Testament, God's word is active. His word is powerful in creation. So you read like Genesis 1, 3, and God said, let there be light. And it happened, right? There was light. God said it, his word went out and it happened. Creative power in God's word. Not only that, Psalm 33, the heavens were made by the word of the Lord and all the stars by the breath of his mouth. He spoke and it came into being. He commanded and it came into existence. The word, God's word accomplishes things. God's word accomplishes things. Isaiah 55, 11, my word. So we can't always say that about our word. Just by speaking something, it happens. But God, my word that comes from my mouth will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I please and will prosper in what I send it to do. Psalm 107, he sent his word and his word healed them. He rescued them from their traps. A word of judgment, Psalm or Isaiah 9, 8, the Lord sent a word or a message against Jacob. It came against Israel. So why does John start with the word? It's because God communicates and he, he speaks to communicate his existence, his purposes, his character. He guides people with his word. He saves with his word. He delivers. He judges with his word, through his word. God's word is so closely identified with himself, which is why Psalm would say also, forever your word is, is fixed in heaven. Just as God is forever, so his word is forever. One person said it this way, the way um, a human being's audible words relate to their invisible thoughts. God's word Jesus relates to the invisible God. 
A theologian said it this way, where God is, his word is, and vice versa. Another verse, D.A. Carson said, God's word is his ultimate self-disclosure. God's speaking to us in the most human way possible through his word. So even, like, even before we think through different categories, we get very, very clear this person is categorically different before we hear his name for the first time, before we hear that earthly name, Jesus, God the Son. Like we're expanding and adjusting and sometimes even blowing up all categories we have because they're not adequate. The one you're about to meet in the book of John, that John wants you to meet, is categorically different when it comes to, first of all, when it comes to time. When it comes to time, these are John's words in verse one, in verse two. In the beginning. In the beginning. So you have categories. We have categories. We have categories like birthdays, when someone was born. And so undoubtedly, even this weekend, there were probably birthdays celebrated. And so people went to birthday parties and recognized this day, this day is kind of when it all started for this person, for this family. We mark that. We have birth certificates. We write a certain date on that. Even obituaries, when we write those, often we'll start with this particular day when they were born. And so that's the way we mark time. That's our category. Those categories aren't enough here. Never before have we met a human that was in the beginning. It's different from even religious talk about, you know, some religions that will talk about reincarnation, you know, that like, well, there was this thing and then you kind of come back as this thing and then you come back as this thing. And even if you tried to talk about like, well, from day one, we're talking about someone that precedes day one. So, I mean, your mind does begin to get blown on that. Never before have we met someone who's in the beginning. There are places to talk about Bethlehem and the birth of Jesus. And the Bible does that. But even there, Isaiah prophesies a child will be born, but a son is given. Just interesting why some of those different word choices happen. It's like the son comes to us because in the beginning was the word. When you meet Jesus, you are meeting someone who is eternal. When you're meeting Jesus, you're meeting someone who is eternal. There is no time when he was not. So if you're, if you're clued into the Bible, when you read the words in the beginning, you think like, oh, I've heard that before. That's another book of the Bible that I've heard that start. Another book of the Bible starts that way. And it's the book of Genesis, right? I don't think it's coincidence that John starts it that way, but notice something even different than Genesis. So in the beginning, God created, we have God doing something, but John starts this way. In the beginning, it's not just doing, but it's being. The word's there. The word is there. Jesus would say later on in the book of John, in John 8, he'd say this thing that really puzzled people, but it does make sense if he's in the beginning. He says, before Abraham was, I am. The Bible's a big book. There are definitely parts where, you know, Christians come to different conclusions on things, how to interpret exactly. I will say, though, these verses in the first part of John are not those where like, ah, we can all just come to different conclusions. You think Jesus was in the beginning. I kind of think he was not. And we all just kind of see things differently. This is one of those things that's just so foundational and so bedrock that if, if you don't believe this about Jesus, whatever Jesus you have in your head, it's not the Jesus of Scripture. It lays it down so firmly here. This is settled from the beginning of Christianity. This is what it means to follow Jesus. This is what it means to believe in Jesus, that he is there at the beginning. And it is a big claim. And some of you may be even, like that may push, you may be glad to identify as a Christian, but, but sometimes, or maybe just a skeptic, maybe you think like, I don't know, that's a lot to say about a human being, because we do all have birthdays, and then you're saying, am I supposed to sp- suspend judgment and say, oh, but one was from the beginning, and you might come in here a bit skeptical and go like, I, I just try to like be reasonable and rational. I don't just want to accept religious dogma. I want to think through things on my own. And you're invited to do that. I I would tell you as you do that, though, could I ask you to play something out? Just play this out. Play out the idea that what if the one who God's word teaches was so loving toward people, so loving toward kids, that when the little kids came to him 
And the grown-ups all said, he doesn't have time for you. Like, get away. We're doing like grown-up stuff here. Like, you, you get away. When, when the grown-ups did that, Jesus had no time for that. And says, no, they, they actually bring them first. Like, let them come to me first. And I imagine, like, imagine this. This one Jesus would learn names. What's your name? And I imagine he would smile at their stories and smile just being around them. Let your mind, again, maybe you're skeptical, but let your mind think through, what if that human being was in the beginning? In the beginning. What if he is eternal? What might that mean for you? What could that mean for your family? What could that mean for your future? We have categories when it comes to get to know someone. So some of that is like time, and now we're, we're dealing with a, a whole different category, categorically different. There's another category difference with Jesus, and that is his relationship with God. His relationship with God. Let me use John's words. The word was with God, and the word was God. This is a category, category difference. I might talk about like having a special relationship with God. I might say like we are God's children. I, I could even say like, man, that person seems so close to God. Or I might also say someone seems like pretty far from God right now. Or I might say someone, man, they act like they're God. So we could have all these different relationships with God. But then we read here, like those relationships don't, they're inadequate. They don't work. Never before have we met a person who was with God and was God. When you meet Jesus, you're meeting someone who is, who is distinct and the same. Distinct and the same. Let me explain. Like he's distinct. He's with God. There's close, intimate fellowship. There is nearness, but there's still a difference. Like he's with God. He's with God the Father. But then just right after you read that, he is distinct, but yet he was God. The same essence. Everything that makes God, God is possessed by this one that we learn his name is Jesus. He's the word. Everything. He's not just like, man, he's a lot like God. No, no, that won't do. He's almost divine. That will not do. That's not what this passage says. He is distinct and yet he's the same. And you say like, I don't know that I have categories for that. That's right, we don't. We have to, we have to make a new one for this person, Jesus. Other scriptures are going to like continue to beat this drum, which is why Jesus will say, I and my father are one. It's why Thomas, when he comes to like post-crucifixion, post-resurrection, Thomas will say this about Jesus. You are my Lord and you are my God. It's like, oh, I think one of the high points of the whole book of John. This description that has our attention. It is so, so tough for some people that they just kind of like, I think this is my exit ramp because I can't believe that someone could be a human and God. With God, was God. It's actually where there are other religions that form, cults that form. It's like, ah, I can't say that. That's too much to entrust to a human being. And yet this is what it means to follow Jesus. This is what it means to follow him. Jesus will consistently say, it's not as if we're, we're misunderstanding him. He will consistently say that he is distinct from the Father. He will pray to the Father. And yet at the same time, Jesus will consistently act in ways that we go, no one can do that except for God. He's distinct and he's the same. What if the one who told the beautiful story, the prodigal son, the story of the, the son that wanders but then finds a welcoming welcoming father saying like, where have you been? I've been waiting on you. What if the one who told that beautiful story, what if the one who told the story of the, the good Samaritan, the religious people kind of go around, but then like a hated enemy goes and ministers. What if the person who tells that story, what if he has always been with God? And he's giving us insight into the nature of God. What if he has always been God? How authoritatively that speaks. We don't just like chalk it up and we're like, wow, he's a really powerful storyteller. Who he is, yeah. And so much more. His relationship with God, categorically different. 
and, and his relationship also, another category difference, is his relationship with everything we see. With everything we see, and I could have said we see, touch, feel, taste, experience. I mean, it's, it's all of it. Because these are John, John's words in verse 3. All things were created through him. How many, John? All, all things. And you feel like he could have put a period at the end of that, and we would have gotten it. And John's like, he starts putting it in all caps now, or like exclamation points or emojis underlined. However, you like to really, really make a point. He does that because he says, apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. So again, I say, you have your categories, we have our categories. I would say like, okay, this person is really, really creative. Some of you, you, you started a company. Like you had the force, some of you are engineers and you've designed a process and it's yours. Like you've, you've worked that out. You have all the creative energy to kind of see how something could flow, see how something could operate. We talk about people who are, creative, you, you go, this is the person who made that. Or you see a beautiful painting and go, she's the one who did that. Or you hear a beautiful piece of music and go, this is the, this is the composer of that. Or you read something and go, that's the author. They, they wrote that. So we have all these sort of categories to go like, what a creative mind. How do they do that? But this is, I just want you to realize this is altogether different. Never before have we met a person where we could say, yeah, all things were created through him, 100%. When you meet Jesus, you are meeting someone who is the creator of every single thing. All life traces back to him. You think, well, wait a minute, I, I thought God the Father created, and you would be right, he does create. And right there in Genesis 1, 2, you have the spirit of God hovering over the face of the deep. He's right there creating as well. But don't miss Jesus. Hear God's word here, Colossians 1.16. Everything was created by him. Who? Jesus. In heaven and on earth, the visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Hebrews 1 says it this way, God has appointed him, Jesus, the son, heir of all things, and he made the universe through him. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature. He sustains all things by his powerful word. So when we, when we encounter Jesus, when we meet Jesus, which, which John is wanting us to do, when we meet him, we are meeting the author of life, which is, the, it's no wonder he says, I am the resurrection and the life. It's no wonder he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, because all life generates from him. He's the creator of every single thing. He's the creator of new life. So in John, you're going to hear, you must be born again. You've got to have new life. He's the creator of that. In Christ, old things pass away. We become new, so much so that it's said, you're a new creation. Who creates the new life? He's the creator of it all. He's the creator of every single thing. So what does it mean when this one says, I'm the bread of life? Like, you can be sustained by me. I'm the living water. You can, you can be sustained by me. What does that mean? You back up to, to the beginning. I don't know how you put all, everything together at the beginning, but somewhere at the beginning, in all of what we have, everything we see and taste and touch and feel and hear, we realize, oh, we trace that back to him. Category difference category difference between any of us. Not only though just the relationship with everything we see, but there's one more aspect against, again where I see even in these few verses that he is categorically different. And that would be his life's mission, the mission of his life. And what he came here to do. Why, why God the Son entered space and time as we know it. These are John's words in verse 4. In him, the word was life, and that life was the light of men. And that light shines, and it's present tense there, to just keep shining. It shines on in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. We'll talk about these words more in coming weeks because they come up a lot. John talks a lot about light. He talks a lot about life. But the picture is clear. In the darkness, we were waiting without hope and without life. We, we were stuck. 
and a light shines and it is still shining and it is Jesus. I love this picture because after saying he created all things, it's not as if he's just a casual observer. It's not as if he says, I'm going to wind this thing up and then you just go, you got it. You know what? School year 24, 25, you got it. Your career, you got it. Alzheimer's, you got it. Career achievements, you've got it. The rest of this year, holiday planning, you've got it. It's not as if he's just a casual observer, not willing to like get his hands dirty and going, I hope they don't mess it up, but they probably will. And look, there they have. It's not as if that, because we read like right after creating all things, he enters into this space, the mission of his life. He comes on mission. He comes with a a purpose to rescue and to save. So much so that darkness, not even darkness, not even deep darkness can stand against it, cannot resist it. The light wins. A lot of scholars that I was reading see a connection. I I think it's a Bible connection. They see a connection here, just the hint at the crucifixion where it seems like darkness wins, right? I mean, it literally was dark as Jesus died and gave his last, last breaths. It's almost like, ah, darkness is one. If it can take down a perfect man, if it can take down God in flesh, it can take down anybody. It seems like darkness and sin and death and the devil and demonic forces, all those are going to win. But then he rises from the dead. He rises from the dead. And once again, we recognize the light overcomes that darkness. We come back to our categories here. So there are a lot of people in this world, and there are people at Brainerd who, like, you make it your mission in life to serve people. There's some of you that, like, your heart bleeds for underprivileged people, and you move toward that space. Some of you, that's why you got into teaching. That's why you got into social work. That's why, I mean, you're the person in the office that's going to notice the person that everybody else misses. And and there are traits and there's qualities. You see someone like a, a teacher or a medical professional and some of that, like that's the drive. Like the reason why you got into all of that is because you wanted to serve and you wanted to help and you wanted to love. But those categories even there, as beautiful as they are, we actually have something categorically different. Never before have we met a person who is the light of the entire human race. I don't know anybody making that claim. I am here so that the entire human race for however many hundreds and thousands of years, like they will exist through me. I will enlighten everybody. Like that, what a bold claim. What a strong claim. Who thinks of themselves that way? That's exactly what we hear Jesus coming. Like he would be the light of human, light of mankind. John wants you to meet someone. He's going to go through and introduce you. And verse after verse, we're going to get to know this one that means so much to John. I, I really have a sense, means a lot to a lot of us in this room. As you meet Jesus, you're going to encounter him, how he interacts with family members. You're going to encounter Jesus as, as he meets with the religious as he meets with those who have made a mess of life. You're going to see again and again, this is who he is. But today we're we're thinking about those category differences. Maybe you're sitting there going like, I hear all that. I think I believe all that as much as I understand it. Curtis, you've explained these verses and what they mean about Jesus. Maybe you still have a few questions, but you can kind of see many of the connections. But maybe actually it's been hard to listen because you would go like, here's, here's where I live though, Curtis. I mean, I hear all this about God being, you know, Jesus being eternal. I hear about him being distinct and saying, got it. I, I think I understand that. But Curtis, if you walked with me through this upcoming week or this past week, my life is so busy and so chaotic. And I don't know that there's a million connections that I see. Maybe you feel like I can barely keep up. My house is filled with kids. My head, my heart's all over the place. I I sense like this is really important stuff. Maybe you think like clearly it matters to you, Curtis, but I, I just have a lot on my heart, a lot on my mind. Trying to raise kids, trying to raise grandkids, sometimes trying to 
care about people well, or maybe you're the person walking through chemo treatment number four, or maybe now it's like 14, or maybe you've lost count. Maybe you're a caregiver in a deteriorating situation and you go, I hear that, but whew, life has gotten really, really hard and really complicated. Or maybe you are the person that is working through some deep shame and guilt, some things in life where it feels like, I, I don't know that I can recover. And I don't know how, you know, I hear what you're saying about the word and I, I get that. But I'm just so ashamed of myself, Curtis. I don't know where I would start. Or maybe I think about the person that's not here, but we should think about, and that's the person who is a Christian in a part of the world where it costs them to even identify as Christian. They couldn't do this gathering like we're doing in public. Maybe they would be persecuted. Maybe they would be taken to prison. They'd be ostracized from their family. And so you go, okay, we've, we've like anchored down some category differences, got it. But what does it mean and what's the point and does what we've learned about Jesus really make a difference? And I think it's a fair question. I think it's a very, very fair question, important question. If I walk through some things, maybe it will help make some connections where this isn't just like, well, that'd be great in a theology textbook. Maybe if we walk through some things, it could come alive to us, what actually these things could mean for us. So I mentioned, you know, I mentioned parents and little kids. So imagine a parent or a grandparent is praying with their little kid. And maybe their kid has really, really worried. Or maybe they have been bullied. Maybe the kid is just curious in a childlike way. And it's so sweet at times, they just want God to use them and they want God to do something with their life. And so the parent, the grandparent, and the Sunday school teacher says, let's pray this way. Let's pray. We're going to pray in Jesus' name. Because Jesus, and as best we can explain it to whatever age level, it's like, because Jesus cares about these things. And so we teach this child, and then we hear the child pray in their own words. And you get a sense like, they believe they are talking to Jesus. And so when they say, in Jesus' name, it's not really a tagline. It, it means something to them. And then it dawns on you. This isn't just a fairy tale. We're not, we're not just trying to find an emotional release for family life. The one who was in the beginning has like leaned his ear to this child who is putting requests on their lips and verbalizing them. And this one who is in the beginning cares about that child's prayer. I just have to think that is world changing. That could change, like literally, I do believe that could change the world. Who Jesus is matters. Who that child is praying, what name that child is praying in, that matters, it matters supremely. Or I, I do go back to the persecuted brother or sister, and maybe this morning, like, maybe I, I don't know their name. Maybe the name couldn't even be pronounced well by me. They're in East Asia, or maybe they're in Nigeria, or maybe they're in the Middle East, and they love Jesus. And in that moment where they, maybe they're persecuted, maybe their family has said, you're not a part of our family anymore. Or maybe they're in prison because of what they, the person they've trusted in, you know what they don't need? They don't need some imaginary friend to help them. It will not, it will not help to go like, well, there's just going to have to be some social adaptation that goes along here. No, no, no. What you're experiencing is just, you know, it's biochemistry and you'll get over it. It's all right. But what if that person who we will spend eternity with, what if that person even as I speak today remembers a passage that Paul wrote in prison where he said, you know, everybody else left me, but the Lord Jesus stood by me. And what if in that moment, that dark place that we may never hear about, we may never know, what if she begins to understand that the God of angel armies is like right there present? Will not leave, will not forsake. And what if it dawns on her, the one who was with God the one who was God is standing by me, even if they take my life, 
he has made a personal promise that he has gone to prepare a place for me. And if he went, he would come back and I will be with him for eternity. Who Jesus is matters. Who we understand him to be matters. Or we walk through again with that person, another chemo treatment. The last thing that person having another chemo treatment, the last thing they would need is uh, positive energy or good vibes. That's not enough. They need something so much more. And what if that, in that moment where chemicals are just wreaking havoc on a body, what if they recognize the words of Jesus that he's the good shepherd? He knows his sheep. What if that becomes just reality? One day I will see him with a new body, not a figment of my imagination, but I will see him face to face. And what if again, it dawns on us, wait a minute, he's the one who made every single thing. And just like Paul said, when he had this thorn in the flesh he was dealing with, he got a word from Jesus himself, my grace is enough for you. My grace is gonna be enough. It's gonna be enough tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. You need nothing more. It will be enough. My grace is going to help. And what if in that moment, the person who's dealing with Alzheimer's or dealing with caring for someone with dementia, what if they get infused with the strength of the Lord and recognize I can do all things through Jesus because he's given me his strength. Or what if the peace of God, which passes all understanding, is infused into you? And there's a sense it's going to be okay. Or I did mention the person that walks around deeply ashamed, wrestling with guilt. You walk, I mean, let's be honest, I, there are times where you walk in this place wondering, do I really belong? I mean, everybody else looks like so good and so spiritual and probably loves Jesus so much, probably have behaved pretty well their whole life. And then there's, and then there's you, or then there's me. And we begin to think about that and maybe the shame piles up and you realize like I've messed up and I've caused pain and I've tried to cover it up and maybe I've even tried to recover and try to dig out and you just find yourself digging even deeper holes. Well, again, the one you're being introduced to, when you meet Jesus, you're meeting the one who gives light to the entire human race, which does mean, yes, he sees you in your sin. No surprises. Like, he knows exactly what's going on in our, in our lives. He's knowing what's going on in our head and our heart even before we do things that would embarrass us. He knows it. He sees me in my darkness. And what if Jesus Christ himself shines there? What if you get the sense that God loved the world so much that he gave Jesus, his one and only son, And if I believe in him, as I rest in him, as I rely in him, with all my guilt, with all my regrets, with all my shame, with all my rebellion, as I rest in him and trust in him and turn from everything else and turn to him, I have an assurance that I, my life will not be obliterated. I will not perish. But I actually will have everlasting life. I I will come alive. I will come alive. I'll become who I was created to be. So this is why, like, I'm excited for you to meet, meet Jesus through the book of John. But we start off today recognizing you and I need something more than just a really good human being. You need someone categorically different. And that's who we meet when we meet Jesus. Can we pray? Thank you, Lord. Father, we praise you for your perfect plan, your perfect wisdom, your perfect timing. And we praise you, Jesus, that whatever categories we have, they get blown. And we confess this is who you are. Christ be magnified. We want you to be lifted up, lifted high. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you would 
make all these truths come alive that you would assure us and convict us and guide us into the paths of truth and make the words that uh, John wrote 2,000 years come off that page and actually make their way into our schedule tomorrow and Wednesday and a month from now. And all these things, we pray that you be honored and you be glorified because Jesus, you are the foundation of our life. You're the cornerstone. And we praise you for that. Amen. I invite you to stand. Can we sing to him? Can we sing to this cornerstone? Can we sing as a confession of our heart that our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus?
Good morning, church. My name is Josiah, and I get the privilege to serve here as one of our pastors. Thank you for joining us for worship this morning. I know it's a little bit of a packed room, and we've got some extra seats in the middle. Man, praise God for a good day of worship today. As you leave, if you want to know more about Jesus and who we're talking about, if you want to pray with a pastor, I know Pastor Curtis will be back there. I'll be back there. Barry Wilkes will be back there. We would love to take time as you're leaving uh, to do that with you. As you leave, I'm going to leave you with 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in the grace and peace of our good King Jesus.